will be great. And then, how can we pray for you? If you ever have a need or anything, fill one of these guys out. There's some boxes in the back of the church. We would love to pray with you. And some of you do drop off some notes for us to pray for you. And we have prayed for you. And we pray that God will keep doing some great stuff in you. How's it going? Good? Great? It is definitely not as cold this Sunday as it was last Sunday. Thank you, Jesus. I met a guy from Boston. He probably looked at me saying, what's wrong with you, man? This isn't cold. It's like it's cold for us. I told him I didn't want to have the wind blow through my hair at all, so that's why I wear a beanie, you know. <laughs> hey, as we continue the book of Acts, we're going to finish off our two-parter called The Fearful and the Fearless. There are many things in this life that cause us to fear, amen? Just live life just a little bit, and all of these fears kind of rush in like it's Black Friday. Just this fear, just this rush of thoughts, this rush of what's going to happen, how are we going to get over this, how are we going to make ends meet, how are we going to fix this, how about my health, all of these things kind of rush in and it causes us a, a little bit of fear. Last week I asked you, how do you want to live? Do you want to live fearful or fearless? Yes, that's who I want to be too. I want to live my life fearless, but I find myself oftentimes combating fearfulness like this. I want to live fearless, but there's this thing called life sometimes that makes me a bit fearful. I was telling first service, I have to listen to the same messages that you do. And sometimes I am convicted by, by those messages. But to live a life fearless for Jesus, just not really caring about anything but Jesus, that's, that's where I want to be. And as we read the Bible, we find out so many great men and women of God that are just like us. But they seem to be different. There seems to be something about them that they were just not caring about anything but, but Jesus. And I, I want to be there. The, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, it says uh, of these folks, it says, the world was not worthy of them. Think about that. The world was not worthy of these followers of Jesus. And I wonder if you and I were around during that time, would that also speak of us? Would, would we be included in that, that the world was not worthy of these folks. I mean, what was different about them that, that God himself would say, the world was not worthy of these folks. If you never had the chance of reading uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, it's a beautiful book. I've not gotten all the way through it, but I want to share to you a little bit about a man named Polycarp. He was arrested on the charge of being a Christian. He was a member of the politically dangerous cult whose rapid growth needed to be stopped. It says this about Polycarp. Polycarp, the venerable bishop of Smyrna, hearing that persons were seeking for him, he escaped, but he was discovered by a child. After feasting the guards who apprehended him, he desired just one hour in prayer, which being allowed, he prayed with such fervency that his guards repented that they had been instruments in taking him. He was, however, carried before the proconsul condemned and burned in the marketplace. The proconsul then urged him, saying, Swear, and I will release thee. Just reproach Christ. Polycarp answered, Eighty and six years have I served Christ, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who has saved me? It goes on to say, At the stake to which he was only tied but not nailed as usual, as he assured them, that he would stand immovable. The flames on their kindling, it says, encircled his body like an arch without touching him. And the executioner on seeing this was ordered to pierce him with a sword when so great a quantity of blood flowed out as extinguished the fire. But his body at the instigation of the enemies of the gospel, especially the Jews, was ordered to be consumed in the pile. And the request of his friends who wished to give it a Christian burial, it was rejected. They nevertheless collected his bones and as much of his remains as possible and caused them to be decently interred. Polycarp just 
Just reject Jesus and you're going to live. This guy said, 86 years have I served him, and not once has, has God wronged me. What would we have done? Somebody says, hey, you're a Christian, so you're under arrest. You are under arrest. And if you just say, you recant your faith in Christ, all's going to be well. What will we do? What will we do? You can live, but you just have to, you just have to deny, deny Christ. We're talking about fear this morning. We're talking about being fearless. Now, for the most part, we probably won't be arrested for being a follower of Jesus, at least not at this moment. But what if it was illegal to be a follower of Jesus? Would you and I be arrested? Would they say, you are one of those? Or will we just kind of blend in with, with the masses? Ask yourself today, am I living my life fearless or fearful? Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 4, as we uh, see from Peter's example of what living a life fearless looks like. Acts chapter 4, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the book of Acts. Chapter 4. If you need a Bible, there should be one in front of you. And if you don't have one, feel free to take that one home. And when you get there, give me an amen. Amen. All right. Good job, everybody. Acts chapter 4, it says this, starting at verse 5. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, they were gathered together at Jerusalem. Now remember, previously, they were put in, uh, in prison. They were in custody for healing the man that was uh, born lame. It was says in verse 7, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, hey, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. I love verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Thank you, Jesus. If you're taking notes, our first point this morning is what to do when we are fearful. Anybody ever been afraid? Once or twice? Three or four times? What do you do when you're afraid? When fear hits your mind, what's the first thing that, that you do? I, um, I don't like dogs besides my own, and um, I like to run a little bit. But when I, see a, when I see a dog, it's like, okay, do I go the other direction? Is the owner going to... Get the dog. Am I going to have to run faster than I want? But I see a dog, and I'm like, oh, here we go again. I had this bad experience. So I see a dog, and I'm like, oh, go around, just go around. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to go around. So then as I'm running closer, I'm like, hey, how are we doing? You're going to get that, right? I don't want to run any faster than I have to, so is your dog Okay. Because that, that fear says, okay, you're going to run, and that dog's going to say it's playtime. <laughs> so the fear in me says, let the owner know that you're coming up so there's no issues, there's no problems, there's no surprises. And maybe some of you have similar fears where something is about to happen, and you're like, oh, you go, your mind goes to the far extreme of the negative. Anybody ever do that? Something's about to happen, you're like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Nothing's happened yet, but your mind has already taken you to the worst case scenario. It's this thing called fear. What do we do with this thing called fear? You see, Peter and John, they are before the religious people. They're like before the Supreme Court of our time. And these guys are just regular fishermen. So you can imagine, two regular fishermen 
are before this high court of Israel. I mean, these are some powerful people that they're in front of. You can imagine. Not only are they before these religious people, but they are before the very people that Jesus was in front of. Ooh. What do you th do then? So your mind is going, oh no. These are the very people that put Jesus to death. And I'm just a fisherman. Listen to what the Bible says about these, uh, this time here. It says, those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas. We just read about this guy right now. The high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and entered in. And he sat down with the officers to see the outcome. So Peter was there, maybe two months ago, watching it all unfold. Now Peter is there in the midst of these same guys. Talk about having some fear. Talk about, oh my goodness, is what happened to Jesus about to happen to us? And these are real feelings. These are real fears. And what do you do when, when you are fearful? What I love about the Bible is that it doesn't, it doesn't skip over the, the struggles of its heroes. Abraham is called the father of our faith. Well, when Abraham was fearful, does anybody remember what he did twice? He said his wife was his sister. The Bible says he is the father of our faith the upper echelon, but yet he, during a time of fear, he lied and said his wife was his sister. You guys remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? You can imagine, young guys, probably a little fearful, but they said, you know what? We're not going to bow down to your idol. Heat that thing up and let's go. Let's go. Because they knew God was going to deliver them. So we have Abraham was fearful, he didn't trust in God. We have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were fearful. They were fearless. And they trusted in God, and God delivered. God delivered them. Which one do we tend to follow? Well, I'm a little fearful, so maybe I just lie a little bit. Or if I'm fearless, God, you've got to work these things out. You see, when we know that God has a plan, it should put us a little bit at ease. Listen to what Jesus told his disciples. It says, now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer. What, Jesus? What are you talking about? Don't worry. The magistrates, the authorities, don't worry. Listen to what the Bible says. It says, don't worry about what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Um, Jesus says, hey, you guys, when I'm gone, they're going to take all of you. You're going to get arrested. You're going to be before some powers of Israel. But you know what? Don't freak out. Don't be afraid because I'm going to tell you what to say. Now, if you're like me, I'm a planner. I don't necessarily like to just go do stuff. Let's sit down. Let's map it out. Let's plan. Let's make some reservations. Jesus is saying, hey, don't worry about anything. I'm going to give it to you when you need it. Does that not bother some other people? I'm like, Jesus, no, we need, we need to know where we're going, Jesus. I just can't just wait for you to tell me what I need at the right time. Because I'm like, okay, God, you're, are you, you going to show up? Because sometimes I'm like, God, you need to hurry up. <laughs> Things aren't going so well down here. We, we needed you like five minutes ago. But just like God, is he comes on in at just the right time. So Jesus says, don't worry what you're going to say. I am going to tell you what you are going to say. Listen to verse 7. It says, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? We have a time to testify. He's in the midst of them. They're surrounded by these guys. Tell us by what power or by what name have you done this? To testify, it means to make a statement based upon personal knowledge or belief. Bear witness to serve as evidence or proof, simply just to testify of what you know. So it's interesting here that it seems that Peter has a choice. Hey, Peter, what do you have to say about this guy that is now standing that was once lame? Peter could have said, well, you know what happened was 
I uh, was leaving uh, Jerusalem, and I was going to the temple, and uh, I saw this man, and you know what? I've been reading my Bible. I've been praying a lot, and I just lifted this guy up, and I said, hey, in the name of Peter, rise up and walk. Peter didn't say that. He didn't say, you know, I'm before all these religious people, it's time for me to up my game. It's time for me to enter into the, the crowd there. If I can just make this religious folks think that I'm awesome, then things will be well. I mean, this is my opportunity to shine. Hey, let us know how this happened. What would you have done? Tell us why this man is walking. What would you say? I mean, you're before like the religious folks. I mean, you could get a nice job probably. Hey, put me on staff. I do this stuff all of the time. Peter doesn't say anything like that. What's wonderful about the Bible is that it just tells it exactly how it is. Peter is before the religious powers of the day, and he's testifying about Jesus Christ. He's proclaiming the greatness of God. Now, family, mostly, most of all of us probably won't be surrounded by this high court, but there are times in life when we felt surrounded. We feel that the walls are closing in and maybe thoughts are flooding our minds, and what do we do then? Sometimes we say, God, where are you? God, we need your help. Maybe we should do what David did. The Bible says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. The Bible says they wanted to stone David. David didn't say, woe is me, woe is me. He says, you know what? I need to go encourage myself. Does anybody talk to themselves in here? Uh, whoa, bunch of crazy people. Bunch of crazy people. Just walking around talking to yourself. That's all right. That's all right. Sometimes we need to encourage ourselves. Sometimes we don't have to wait for other people to encourage us. When's the last time you took your crazy self outside with your Bible and just walked around and read it aloud? Just encouraging yourself. Your neighbors are going, there they go again. See, kids, this is what happens when you do drugs. You walk around with the Bible around the neighborhood talking out loud. Kids, you don't want to be like the stay in school, kids. But when's the last time you, you went just with you and Jesus and you began to encourage yourself? You began to say, wait, the scripture says that God is not going to leave me nor forsake me. The scripture says he who has began a great good work is, is going to complete it. That he's not going to leave me undone. When was the last time we just encouraged ourselves? We're, we didn't, we're not dependent upon anyone else to encourage us. We just got along with the word of God and says, Lord, your, your word in Psalm 66, it says, come in here all who fear God and I will declare what he has done for my soul. Sometimes, family, we just need to encourage ourselves. So I want to encourage you, just get along with some Jesus. Get the scriptures out. And if you're down right now, okay, grab this thing, go on a walk and read, a, read it aloud so your mind can hear about the goodness and the greatness of God. David encouraged himself in the Lord. They wanted to kill this guy. They wanted to stone him. But David encouraged himself. So we need to be, begin to encourage ourselves. Sometimes we're not going to encourage one another as we should. But that's okay once in a while. But if that happens, go encourage yourself. Be like David and just God, this is what your word says. I just want to encourage myself and build myself up. I love it about John the Baptist. He's a wonderful pattern of someone just testifying of Jesus. It says, there was a man who was sent from God, and his name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. He's simply bearing witness of of Jesus. That's, that's all he's doing. Sometimes we get the notion that, well, I need to have read the Bible through three or four times before I can really be used of God. You're not, you're not going to find that here. The guys that are on trial right now catch fish for a living. No amen to that one, huh? <laughs> They're fishermen. Anybody been on a fishing boat before? And fishermen are a little rough. Deep sea fishermen, a little rough. They're regular fishermen, and look what God is doing doing through them. Listen to what Peter says. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. We've got to stop there because that's number two. What to do when we are fearless. He is filled with the Holy Spirit. 
They were filled at Pentecost, but it doesn't stop there. They don't just take that Pentecost filling throughout their entire lives. No, the Bible says we should be filled and refilled again and again. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk with wine. That leads to wild living. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Most of you are going to leave this place and go get some food. Amen? And guess what? The waitresses or the waiter is going to come around and they're going to say, what would you like to drink? You're going to order something good. They're going to come back around a couple minutes later on. They're going to what? Refill your glass. All of us probably drink more than one of our beverage. So they're going to come around over and over again to make sure that you have enough things to drink. The Bible talks about that you and I should be filled with the Holy Spirit over and over and over and over again. Why? Because God wants to do something in us, and the power and strength that we have is insufficient. That's why the worship team, before they practice, they pray. Before they leave, they pray. Before I teach, we pray. Why? Because we need us some Jesus. We need help. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. So Peter didn't just roll on through his thing. Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Pastor Greg Lowry says it like this. We are to be constantly filled with the Spirit again and again and again. I love that. Same thing for you and me. Again and again, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, Peter goes on in verse 9, and it says, If this day we are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, and by what means he was made well. So, guys, you're, just to make sure we're all on the same page, we're here in front of you because a lame man is now walking. You guys don't have better things to do? <laughs> We're here talking about a man that was lame and now is walking. Family, why didn't the religious people say, I want to know the God who did this. I, I want to know this for my own life. I want this kind of power in my life. I want to be transformed by this power right there. Why didn't they do that? Well, why didn't they say, they walked past this guy, he, he was crippled for 40 years, they walked past him day in and day out till they knew that a miracle had happened, but they didn't ask, how can this miracle radically change me? They knew this guy, but it didn't change them. We talked a couple weeks ago that seeing a miracle won't change us. Now, it might be cool for Facebook, I'm sure your, your likes will probably blow up, but it's not going to change people. These religious people saw this man who was obviously crippled, now walking. He's standing right there, and they didn't ask for their own selves. All of us have areas in our lives that need some resurrection power. Amen. I've got some areas in my life where, Jesus, I would love for you to touch this crippled area in my life. God, I need you to, to do something in this area. But the religious didn't care. And that's what, that's what the word is. scares me about being religious sometimes, if we can use that term is that sometimes we just miss Jesus. Think about this. The very person they grew up hearing about, studying, praying about, when he came before them, they killed him. From this high, rehearsing their tables. The Messiah came before them, and they missed the mark so much, they killed him. Sometimes we can be so religious sometimes and just totally miss God. And that's like a fear of mine, that I don't want to be just so this way that I just miss what you have what you have for me, God. I look at these religious people. The evidence is right there, but they don't care. They don't care about this power. This man is here, obviously healed, but they don't care. Matthew 23, Jesus had this issue with the religious over and over again. We'll get back to that one. It says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So they're giving, they're tithing, they're serving. But what about justice, mercy, and faith? Jesus says you should have, you should have done these without leaving the others undone. Oh, well, I, you know, I tithe, so, hey, that frees me up to say whatever I want to say and do whatever I want to do. Jesus says, what about, what about mercy? Never once do you hear about the Pharisees showing anybody mercy. 
was the last time you showed someone mercy? Now, mercy means giving somebody something that they don't deserve. Now, sometimes we can be so religious, we're like, you're getting exactly what you deserve. What is it? Uh, you make your bed, you go ahead and lie in it. Go ahead and lie down. You saddle that horse, you go ahead and ride it now. When was the last time God said that about us? When was the last time God said, never. But yet we, yep, that's what you're, you're getting all that you deserve. Enjoy it. Spoon it all up. Take the biscuit and just sop the rest of it up and eat it. Because that's what you deserve. What about mercy? What about mercy? When was the last time we said, you know what? Mercy. If there are more young kids here, I'd ask them, are your parents merciful to you? They see you waking up, going to church. Let's go. I said, let's go. <laughs> you get to church. Praise Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glad we're here. The kids are going, what kind of craziness is this? Mercy. Showing mercy. These religious folks, they simply don't care. So God, help us. It says in verse 10, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, what do we do when we are fearless? We preach Jesus. Let it be known that by the name of Jesus Christ, and remember, he's before the very people that killed Jesus. So he could have said, well, you know, that one guy that um, you guys didn't like so much. He's before them proclaiming Jesus. That guy that you killed, that guy that you tried to do away with. It's by power in his name that this man stands here whole. I love that. That is by the name of Jesus. Listen to what Jeremiah 10. It says, Inasmuch as there is none like you, O Lord, you are great and your name is great in might. That's why when we pray before a meal, we pray in Jesus' name. Somebody's not feeling well. We lay hands in Jesus' name. We open up church scripture with, with, with Jesus' name. We pray in Jesus' name. Why? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. There's no power in the name of Peter, no power in the name of Henry, no power in the name of Al, no power in the name of John. There's power in the name of Jesus. God, help us to keep Jesus on, on our lips. Just to... It's about Jesus Christ. Peter says, no, there's this power that comes from Jesus Christ, from this name of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 tells us, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above what? Every name. That at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If there is power like that in the name of Jesus, his name should just be coming out like that. You got something wrong with you? In Jesus' name. You are fearful? In Jesus' name. You have a worry? In Jesus' name. Things aren't going right? In Jesus' name. Because there's power in his name. There's no power in worry. So why do we do it so much? Because it feels good, huh? It feels good to worry. I'm just going to keep this thing in my pocket. I'm going to go to bed with it. I'm going to wake up with it. I'm going to drive around with it. I'm going to go to lunch with it. I'm going to go to dinner with it. And then I'm going to go to bed again with it. And then, you know what? I'm going to wake up. I'm going to do it all over again for the next 20 years. Thank you, Jesus. There's no power in the worry. But there's power in Jesus' name. If every knee is going to bow at the name of Jesus, then that should be just coming off of our lips. Things aren't going so good. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Because since there's power, since a crippled man is now walking and leaping for joy, if every knee's going to bow, then just maybe you and I should be talking about some Jesus a lot, that his name is just always coming off of our lips. I may not have all the answers, but I think Jesus does. So let's invite Jesus in on our situation and see what he is going to do. Things may be impossible, but then we bring Jesus in. Okay, let me step back now. You do your thing, Jesus. You ever had that situation? It just looks like, Jesus, I'm not sure. I don't know how you're going to do this, so let me just step back. I've tried. I've tried to do my thing. Let's try this way. Okay, let's try this way. 
you tried all your angles, right? <laughs> Let's look at it from a different angle. And you're like, you know what? We need us some Jesus in this situation. We need somebody that knows it all, someone that has enough power to change me and to change the situation. So I'm going to ask that person whose name is above every name, who has all of this power, here's your present. Jesus, here's an issue. It all belongs to you now. I'm done trying. I need your help. I need your, I need your, your power, Jesus. This name which is above every name. Amen? Good stuff. Peter goes on to say, Whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. What is he letting them know? Jesus lives. That guy you wanted to do away with, that guy you crucified on the cross, he's back. Because of him, we stand here. Because of him, this crippled man is now walking and leaping for joy. You thought if you could just kill him, this whole following Jesus was going to go away. This whole Jesus picture is going to go away. No, no, no. What you guys did, again, remember, they're surrounded. What you guys did, mm -mm, he's alive. We have seen him several times. He was seen by over 500 people at one time. He is back, and he is alive. Acts chapter 2 says it like this. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So if death can't hold Jesus, we better be talking about Jesus all the time. Romans 1, 4, it says, and declared to be the Son of God with what? Power, according to the spirit of holiness, by what? The resurrection of the dead. That is what's exciting, that there is this power that is available for you and for me. It's available for us in our fears to say, God, your son has all of this power. Come fill us with the Holy Spirit. We're fearful, but because of the resurrection of Jesus, oh, the possibilities are great. Possibilities are wonderful. I believe Jesus fills all of these holes in our lives. I believe all of us have these pursuits, money, this, cars, marriages, kids, all of these things. And in the right perspective, there's nothing wrong with that. But Jesus, help us that he would be our greatest pursuit, that we would pursue him. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of righteousness. First, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. So maybe this morning you're here and there's this big hole here. You're filling it with all of these things. I believe Jesus would have you place him here seek him first and he'll take care of everything else why because he is alive you know what jesus is doing right now right hand of god intercessory prayer good job hebrews chapter 7 25 therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost i like that word uttermost because we were there to those who come to god through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He's making intercession for us. He's, he's praying for us. This is so, so exciting. First Timothy 2, 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Who? Are you sure? Is that what that says? I'm getting a little older. I need some glasses soon. But So there's just one mediator between God and man. Not two. Not three? Are you sure? Are you convinced? All right. I know some of you come from a, a different religion to where you were maybe praying to and through all kinds of people. What's great about coming here, Lord willing, is great. We go verse by verse. So you don't have to go through anybody besides Jesus. It's just you and Jesus. That's exciting, right? Maybe it's just me. I'll just give myself one of these right now. It's just me and Jesus. You don't have to go pay, pray through anybody that's dead. And I'm not trying to be offensive at all. But you don't have to pray to pray through or any of the dead saints. You don't have to pray through Mary. Because scripture says here, there's just what? One. Really? Okay. Just one. That should set you free. 
It's just you and God and Jesus. You want to pray to God? Go through Jesus. That's it. That, this is the way that it's meant to be. And how excited it is that not only does Jesus love us, has he saved us to the uttermost, and he's praying for us, but we can get to God through Jesus Christ. Well, Peter goes on and talks about this cornerstone, the cornerstone which you have rejected. What does cornerstone mean? In ancient biblical practices, the cornerstone was the principal stone placed at the corner of an edifice. The cornerstone was usually one of the largest, most solid, and most carefully constructed of any in the edifice. Jesus describes himself as the cornerstone that his church would be built upon, a unified body of believers, both Jew and Gentile. In the New Testament, the cornerstone is a metaphor that has continued at this time. However, the Apostle Paul is preaching to the Ephesian Christians on the purpose of helping them to know Christ better. In chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 19 and 20, he talks about this cornerstone. And the religious would know what this cornerstone would mean because it's a prophetic uh, passage in Psalm 118. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So they would totally understand what this means. Peter goes on to say, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So what we have here lastly, we have Jesus is the only way. No amens for that one? Christianity is so narrow-minded. Why can't all roads lead to God? We're all good people, and God knows our hearts, and it's all going to work out. So why be so exclusive? Well, there's a few reasons that we should be exclusive. And when I mean we, I mean we're just following what the Bible says. That last I read, Muhammad wasn't placed on a cross, didn't have his beard ripped out, a crown of thorns placed on his head, didn't have his back all ripped open, didn't have two nails through his hands, through his feet, and through his side. Didn't happen with Buddha. Didn't happen of any other, other religious leaders. But, but Jesus. Muhammad's bones are still in a tomb somewhere. Buddha's bones are in a tomb somewhere. But Jesus Christ is not in a grave anywhere. So if God gave us his son Jesus to die in our place for our sins, why would there be any other way? You may say, well, that sounds so, so narrow-minded. Sure. Okay. There's no one else that have paid for our sins but, but Jesus Christ. There was a, a, a YouTube, uh, Larry King interviewed a very well-known pastor, and he asked him something to the effect of, um, if a Jewish person doesn't believe in Jesus, would they, would they go to hell? And again, well-known and very, very popular. He was like, well, you know, I mean, who, who can really say, you know, you know, God only God knows their heart. And, you know, who am I to say that this one's not getting in, this one's getting in, this one's not getting in. So, so Larry King went on to say, so, you know, for the most part, is Jesus the only way? And the guy's like, well, you know, who am I to really say? <laughs> I'm like, you're a pastor. Simply tell people the truth. But sometimes in telling people the truth, that may mean that people are going to stop tithing. Oh, my goodness, people are going to stop giving money and leave the church if we tell them the truth. God bless you. Because you know what? We as pastors are accountable for you all. So one day, this guy is going to stand before God the Father. He's going to say, hey, so hey, why were you so afraid to tell them the truth? Well, God, I didn't want them to stop tithing and giving. That's not going to work. That's why we give you the truth. Now, sometimes you might come to church and say, man, that kind of hurt a little bit. I'm listening to the same thing you're listening to. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I need to pray right now. Other times it's real joyful, but sometimes we need to hear that we're some sinners and need to repent of our sins. We need to know that we're going the wrong way. We need to know that things aren't right. It's okay to say, you need to stop doing what you're doing. That's called sin. You need to go before God and ask him to forgive you. Oh, well, that might offend some people. They might leave and go to the church. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> what? 
It's all about Jesus Christ, family. It's all about him and him alone. And, and if you're here this morning and you die without Jesus, you are not going to somehow get a golden ticket. You can't say, well, you know, I'm a good person. Well, good compared to who? Maybe to the person sitting next to you, you could be doing stellar. But compared to God, the Bible says our righteousness is like filthy rags. And if you knew what a filthy rag was, you'd be like, oh, okay, I get it now. So we can't be good enough or holy enough. It's just all about Jesus. So being a simple kind of guy that I am, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I need some Jesus. I know God loves me. I know God poured out his wrath on Jesus, that Jesus died in my place. So if it's narrow to say Jesus is the only way, sign me up. Because I don't know anybody else that has died for this sinner besides Jesus Christ. No one else was willing to take this thing on, but yet God was. So if Jesus is the only one to take our sin on, you better believe we're going to follow him. You better believe that he is the only way. Is it because we say so? No, because God says so. So if you have a problem with Jesus being the only way, you and God talk about it. But we cannot reject God's son and think we're going to spend all eternity with him. It's like this. Parents, parents here. Imagine somebody saying, I can't stand your kids, but I love you. You're going to be like, no, you don't. You're not, gonna, you're not about to say you hate my kids, but you love me. Because if you love me, you love my kids. God, Jesus says, we're loved by the Father. You, know, you want to know why? Because we love him. The Father loves us because we love the Son. Might be narrow-minded, call it what you will, but praise the Lord that Jesus is the spotless lamb who gave himself for us. John chapter 14 says this. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life that no one comes to the Father except through me. That one pastor man should say, hey, Larry King, open your Bible to John chapter 14, verse 6. It's going to offend some people. Some people will probably leave the church. But this is what God's word says. Our job is to simply testify of what the truth says. The truth says Jesus is the only way. And thank you, Jesus, for being that only way. Let me give you one more scripture. Revelation chapter 20. Verse 15, it says, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What about all the good people? Well, the Bible says there's none good. No, not. There's nobody good, so there's no good people. So our thing is to love us some Jesus, make sure our name is written down in this, in this Lamb's book of life, and all will be well. Let me read to you this one. It's called the, the Fellowship of the Unashamed. He says, I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. He says, the die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of his. And I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. He says, my past is redeemed and my present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm done and finished with low living, sight walking, Small planning, smooth knees, and colorless dreams. Tamed vision and mundane talking. Cheap living and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, lavish wealth, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, or tops, or recognized, or praised, or rewarded. For I live by faith. I lean in his presence. I walk by patience. Lifted up by prayer and labor by the Holy Spirit power. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road may be narrow. My way rough. My companions few. But my guide is reliable and my mission is clear. I will not be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice or hesitate in the presence of the adversary. I will not negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, or let up until I have stayed up, soared up, prayed up, paid up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must give until I drop, preach until all know, and I work till he comes. And when he comes for his own, he'll have no problems recognizing me. I want to be in there. Living a life that's, that's unashamed. Living a life 
of, of, of faith, living a life fearless for Jesus, that when he's coming back, he doesn't have to look for his faithful people. May he say, man, that brother, that sister, they were faithful to the end. They had a tough go, but they were faithful to the end. Take home with this. Meet your fears with faith. All of us have fears. Drop some faith in that. Meet your fears with faith. Whatever you're going through right now, we're going to pray. Just meet that with some faith. Lord, we thank you for the power in your name. That by the name of Jesus, we were saved. Our lives were redeemed. We're forgiven of our sins. We have hope in a future. Not because we're so great, but because you are so great. We, like Peter and John, are just common people, Jesus. But we love you. Help us to not be so religious that we miss you. Help us to not be so religious that we miss the people you've placed in our lives that need to see your face, that need to see your hands, need to hear your voice. May we be merciful people. May we be kind people because you've been merciful to us and kind to us. Jesus, we want to lay our fears down before you right now. We've tried angle left, angle right, above, beyond, left, right. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Come and take our fears, Jesus. We want to surrender them to you. You know all things. You've come that we might have joy and have it more abundantly, have life and have it more abundantly. Help us to live the life you wanted us to have, the life you've given us. Help us to find some joy. Help us to leave this place encouraging ourselves in the Lord, knowing that my God has a plan, that there's power in the name of Jesus. So I asked you earlier, do you want to live your life fearful or fearless? Maybe right now, whatever that is in your life, whatever areas of your life that's maybe in a, a crippled state, why don't you just offer that up to Jesus right now? Say, Jesus, here's that thing. Here's that thing that I keep driving around with, I keep holding, I keep thinking about, I keep worrying about, this thing that causes me so much fear. Here it is, Jesus. I want to place it in your hands, Jesus. And if anything is in your hands, Jesus, it's in the best hands possible. So Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I don't know how it happens or how you do it, but Jesus, here's our fears our fears of tomorrow, our fears of today. We just want to give those to you that you might be magnified in them, that we would no longer find ourselves in, 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 in a ball hurtled in, the, in a corner, fear, being, fearing, being fearful of this thing. So however your will is, Jesus, for our fears, we just want to cast them to you. Bless my brothers and my sisters that they would leave this place fearless. Fearless for you, Jesus. Full of joy, full of your Holy Spirit wreaking havoc in this past area for Jesus. That they would say, the people who have turned the world upside down have come here. They're always talking about this Jesus guy. Help us to keep your name, Jesus, on our lips. If you're here this morning, we've been talking a lot about Jesus. He gives life. He forgives sins. He gives hope for this life and the one to come. And I don't want you to miss having that life. So while everyone is praying and their eyes are closed, is there anyone here this morning that would love to invite Jesus Christ into their life that they might have hope, might have their sins forgiven? Anybody here this morning need me some Jesus, need some hope? Thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us, Lord. You're so wonderful. We give you all of these things. And church said, amen, amen. Hey, please stand with us.